What makes December one of the most interesting skies of the year? Well, for one, the Geminids. This is one of the strongest and most reliable meteor showers that we get, and it's one that surprises people who haven't seen it before. But even if you have seen it before, something that may surprise you is the fact that it actually comes from an asteroid rather than the usual comet. At the same time, for those of you who have been following 3i Atlas, which is the third interstellar object ever detected, it's going to be reaching the part of its path where it becomes easiest to observe from Earth. But December also brings a shift in the way the sky feels, with the solstice, when the balance of daylight shifts for Earth's hemispheres. And it's also the time of year when some of the best and brightest constellations return, including with the Orion Nebula, rising into perfect view. I'm Sarah Matthews, grab a snack, and we're going to jump into talking about 3i Atlas as it reaches its closest approach to Earth this month. Now, if for whatever reason you're not already familiar with what 3i Atlas is, it is the third interstellar object ever confirmed, and that means that it did not come from our solar system. It actually came from an entirely different star system somewhere out in the galaxy. And 3i Atlas does have what is called a hyperbolic path. That means it is not gravitationally bound to the sun, and that means that it's just going to go back into interstellar space. But before it does, it is going to be making its closest approach to Earth on December 19th, which is really cool. And that means that we're never really going to ever see it again, unless for whatever reason, there's some sort of weird change to its path, which is unlikely. Brightness predictions are about the same as they were last month, around magnitude 10 to 11. And that means it's not going to be naked eye visible, but if you have a decently large telescope and some cool eyepieces, you may very well be able to see it. Otherwise, I do recommend taking some long exposure images, which should reveal at least a little bit of the comet itself. But again, comets are very unpredictable. Like they could get brighter, they could dim. We just don't know. So yeah, just, you know, temper your expectations is all. Now, early in the month, 3i Atlas does rise in the east around 2 to 3 a.m., starting low in the constellation Virgo. And then each night it does rise a little bit earlier. And by mid-month, right around its closest approach on December 19th, you're going to be able to catch it in the early evening skies instead of the early morning, which is really nice for those of you who don't like to wake up super early. By the end of December, it will be passing near Leo's brightest star, Regulus. Now, again, this is not a naked eye visible comet, so it's not going to be super crazy wild, but it is scientifically just so cool. So I do hope you're able to photograph it and, you know, maybe even frame it. Now, something that is more reoccurring is the Geminids meteor shower. The Geminids meteor shower is one of the most reliable and active meteor showers that we see in the year. It can produce up to 120 meteors per hour in the most ideal conditions, and they're usually very bright and known for being the color yellow. Most meteor showers are born from comets, but the Geminids don't come from a comet at all. They come from a rocky metallic asteroid named 3200 Phathion, which is incredibly unusual. Phathion follows a highly elliptical orbit that takes it extremely close to the sun. And it does show a little bit of activity when it does heat up, almost like a comet does, but really nowhere near enough to explain the thick, rich stream of debris that produces the Geminids. Even stranger though, the core of the Geminid stream doesn't sit right on Phathion's orbit. It's offset. Now, that's not what we would expect from standard comet-like processes, so something else had to have happened. Recent observations from NASA's Parker Solar Probe have reshaped the story. This data suggests that the Geminids weren't created gradually at all, but actually were created in a very sudden, violent event such as a major collision or an explosive disruption sometime in the past. Now, that event blasted huge amounts of material into space, and that debris is now what forms the stream Earth crosses about every December. And this year will be no exception, because the Geminids will be active from December 1st to the 21st, peaking on the night of December 12th into the 13th. And under decently dark skies, you can expect anywhere to 40 to 50 meteors per hour, and possibly up to 120 in the most ideal viewing conditions, when the radiant point, which is the point in the night sky where these meteors appear to come from, is at its highest point. The radiant is in the constellation Gemini, but meteors can streak across any part of the night sky. Now, they are going to be visible for both hemispheres, though the northern hemisphere does get the best views since Gemini does climb higher there. If you're in the southern hemisphere, you can still catch plenty of meteors, especially late at night and into the early morning. 
Now for the best views, you are gonna wanna go somewhere without any light pollution, ideally. And the nice thing about the Geminids is that if you are someone that likes to go to sleep a little bit early, well, you are in luck because the show starts at nine rather than you know around midnight like a lot of other meteor showers do. Now, if you're wanting to photograph it, then I would recommend a wide angle lens with your DSLR or mirrorless camera. A tripod is always great, as well as a remote shutter release so that you're not adding vibration. So if you aren't using a star tracker, I would use the 300 to 500 rule, which is seen here. And if you are using a star tracker, then you of course can take longer exposures and have a little bit lower ISO. Now you can take just a single shot or you can take lots of photos and stack them all together to create this really cool type of composite. It is totally up to you. Now, twice a year, the sun reaches the most extreme points in our sky. In December, it takes the shallowest arc it ever will in the Northern Hemisphere, while soaring higher than any other day in the Southern Hemisphere. That moment is called the December solstice. And the reason this happens isn't distance from the sun, it's actually the tilt of the earth as it orbits on its axis around the sun. That tilt changes how high the sun climbs in the sky and how long each hemisphere stays in daylight. And this is the engine behind our seasons. During the solstice, the sun stands directly over the Tropic of Capricorn. The Northern hemisphere enters its shortest day and longest night, while the Southern hemisphere gets its longest day and the start of summer. If you watch closely around this time, you'll see the sun rising and setting at its farthest south points on the horizon. And in northern latitudes, shadows stretch longer than at any other time of the year. You can actually see the sun's changing position throughout the year in something called the analema. This is a figure eight pattern you get by photographing the sun from the same spot at the same time of day over an entire year. If you wanna learn how to plan and capture one for yourself, I have a full guide on my Patreon. The December solstice marks a shift. From here, the sun begins climbing back the other way, slowly reshaping the light one day at a time. Let's talk about the moon this month. Our full moon is called the cold moon, or in some Native American traditions, it's actually called the long night moon, which is tied to the darker days around the winter solstice. So that makes sense. It does reach full phase on December 4th, bright enough to wash out the sky for a few nights, but as it wanes, the night sky does get darker just in time for the Geminids, which again peaks on December 12th through the 13th. And if you are planning deep sky imaging or just want the cleanest, darkest skies of the month, then the new moon on December 19th is your best window to do that. Now this month, we do have some really cool planetary views. Mercury reaches its best morning appearance on December 6th, rising low in the eastern sky in Scorpius just before sunrise. And on December 7th, the moon and Jupiter make a close approach or a conjunction, depending on where you live, high in Gemini, rising early in the evening. Now, later in the month, on December 26th, the day after Christmas or the first day of Kwanzaa, the moon does pair with Saturn in the evening sky. And Saturn does sit in Aquarius, very low in the south after sunset, right on the edge of Pisces. Neptune is going to be very close to Saturn. It will be low in the south just after sunset, sitting in the constellation Pisces. For Mars and Venus, they are both tucked close to the sun this month, making them pretty difficult to see with the naked eye. And finally, Uranus, the quiet outer world standout of December, does remain visible in the evening sky, rising after sunset and staying up for most of the night. It will be rising in the constellation Taurus near the Pleiades. Speaking of the Pleiades, let's talk more about other deep space objects and the constellations this month. In the Northern Hemisphere, we do have the longest nights of the year, which is awesome. Uh, however, we do not have the Milky Way quarter going on, but that's okay. We do still have the Great Rift that I mentioned last month, which you can see here with Cygnus, which is pretty low, which is a great target to go after if you have a wide field lens or if you even have a more zoomed in telescope. From there, the east lights up with the familiar stars of winter. We have the winter triangle and the larger winter diamond, or sometimes called the winter circle, that's climbing into view. And it's gonna be guiding you straight towards the constellation that dominates December, which is the lovely Orion constellation. And Orion rises in the early evening and climbs higher through the night. And the deep sky objects around here are some of the best of the year and arguably in the entire sky that we can actually see. So we have the Orion Nebula, which is a high dynamic range target due to the very bright trapezium stars in the center here. You do have to be very mindful to not blow the core out. Right next to it, we have the Running Man Nebula, which is a reflection nebula. So it's gonna be a broadband target. You're not gonna to wanna to use narrowband filters really, although you totally still can. 
Um, speaking of narrowband targets though, we do have the Horsehead Nebula, which is probably one of the most iconic targets throughout the world. The Horsehead Nebula is a narrowband target, but you can also use RGB with it. And if you really wanna go wide, we have the sweeping curve of Barnard's Loop, which is a beautiful hydrogen alpha emission. And nearby, we also have the Rosette Nebula in Monasteros, which is also a narrowband target. Now, if you are in the Southern Hemisphere, you get a slightly different, but kind of similar perspective. The Winter Diamond becomes your Summer Diamond because, well, you guys are in the summer right now. It is gonna be rising in the North and Northeast shortly after sunset, but this is gonna be a great opportunity to basically photograph any of the ones I already mentioned, as well as the Pleiades. The Milky Way also changes orientation. It's gonna be parallel to the horizon. From southern latitudes in December, it does stretch almost parallel to the northern horizon, revealing a very beautiful broad sweep of hydrogen-rich nebulae. Now moving across that region, you will find the enormous Gum Nebula and two beautiful open clusters in Puppis, NGC 2477 and NGC 2451, all framed by dense star fields and gas. Then the southern sky opens into things the north never sees. To the south and southeast, we have the massive Carina Nebula rising very high, along with the distinctive shape of Crux, the Southern Cross. The bright blue southern Pleiades IC2602 shimmer nearby, and overhead, both the large and small Magellanic clouds climb into excellent position, two entire dwarf galaxies visible to the naked eye. So what are you imaging or viewing this month? Let me know down in the comments. And if you're looking for some gift ideas for the astronomy loving individual in your life, even if it's yourself, I did put together some gift guides down below that you can check out. And if you would like to support this channel, please consider becoming a patron over on my Patreon and or subscribing to the channel and giving this video a thumbs up. And I'm really looking forward to next year because we have some really cool celestial events coming up. So yeah, until the next video, I hope you all have very clear skies. Thanks everyone.